Okay. All We're right. Ready. So I'll introduce. Greetings, everybody. It's the Kevoy Boys, uh, Master Signified Bodies, also known as Andrew, and Free Beer Tomorrow, Nick. This is going to be a really great episode because we have a special guest with us, uh, Daniel Tut, and we're going to talk about his work, um, psychoanalysis and the politics of the family. Um, Daniel, you want to introduce yourself to those who are fans of this channel, but maybe not have uh, heard of you before? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me, Nick and Andrew. It's really great to uh, see you in the flesh. Um, happy Sunday. Nice to uh, obviously get the wonderful memes that you both create on a daily basis. I'm a huge fan of the memes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so let's see. I just wrote this book for the Paul Grave Lacan series called Psychoanalysis, Politics of the Family, which is uh, looking at the politics of the family, revisiting the the topic, which I feel is not actually addressed, hasn't been addressed too much. Um but but has been of interest to the left and especially uh, the socialist left, socialist feminist left, um, stretching back to the uh, to the early twentieth century. Um, so, you know, we saw a huge, uh, huge degree of interest in the period of the new left in the sixties and seventies and the sexual revolution. So I felt that it was the right time to to turn to this topic. Uh, so excited to chat about the book with you all. But I've been I've been studying psychoanalytic theory for quite a while. I'm a, I live in Washington D.C. I'm a member of the Lacanian Forum. Um, have undergone analysis um, several times. I'm not a practicing analyst, more of a philosopher and theoretician of psychoanalysis. And um, and so yeah, so I teach philosophy and have studied Lacan. Um, one of my mentors is a former student of Lacan. And have benefited also, I would say, from just learning from uh, the Colette Solaire forums movement, uh, which is where my my forum in D.C. is affiliated through Solaire's uh, movement. But um, as you know, in the book, I, I pull from a number of psychoanalytic thinkers and I'm not necess necessarily uh, committed to any sort of any sort of dogmatic uh, uh, approach in psychoanalytic thought. Um, so really, really actually find, I sometimes find that philosophers can get at the concepts of psychoanalysis with greater ease, even than psychoanalytic clinicians can often. I, mean, I don't know if you all agree with that, you know, and uh, I, I studied with Slavoj Žižek as well, and he's a very important figure for me. Um, definitely, we can chat about his, his uh, controversial politics these days uh which is a great of great interest to me as well because i do find that zizek's politics are actually extremely insightful and extremely helpful and as you know in the book i actually lean on a lot of um a lot of his perspectives um on on um on oedipus uh, uh, and on questions of like you could say uh, the lacanian critique of patriarchy which I find I find quite uh, or the the Lacanian view of of contemporary uh, patriarchy, let's call it, uh, if that's the right phrase, I find quite compelling. So I don't know if that's an adequate introduction. I could say more. I'm also writing a work right now on Friedrich Nietzsche, um, looking at re reopening um, a, a new way, a new. Uh, I know we're not going to talk about this today. Uh, but a new way to look at Nietzsche's thought for the left, um, which I think has been missing. Uh, so that's the, I've just finished finished that book, and it should be coming out in a few months with repeater books. So yeah, hopefully that's a good little intro yeah. on me. Oh yeah, yeah, that was that was good. And um, you know what you're saying is that you're not committed to uh, any particular analytic thinker, but yet you know you still are drawing from all these like specific ones. Um, and I'm interested in to really talk about um, Lash more because I mean, in the beginning, the beginning of the book, you, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, a lot of concepts from, from Christopher Lash and mm -hmm. mainly early Lash, right? The culture of narcissism. Um, and would you say that, because you said uh, earlier that the, there hasn't really been much emphasis on the family or talk about the family. Uh, yeah. lately for a lot of like the new left and even Marxist circles. Um, would you say that Lash 
was the perfect gateway for that to understand um, like the sort of dissolution of the family and how it leads to even something what like Lacan would see as synthom, right? The sort of uh, uh, enjoyment, uh, like the narcissistic enjoyment aligned with that Lashian notion of uh, a culture of narcissism, which breaks away from the family. And as you kind of align it towards a market economy, right? Yeah. Lash's insights into the family are quite um, subtle and have been, I think, often misunderstood, frankly, it, it, because he was, he is, well, well, he was a man of the left, first, first, I think it must be said, uh, who was actually, before he wrote Culture of Narcissism, actually wrote a book um, um, called Haven in a Heartless World on the family which is not talked about nearly as much as his uh, best-selling book, The Culture of Narcissism, which which uh, was a bestseller, um, which is quite rare for uh, sort of an academician to to have a, a bestseller. Uh, but you can tell why it was if you if you read it and you see his his style of writing is extremely um, accessible. He's he's basically an American Frankfurt School approach and methodology for the most part, but without the um, burden of um, too much heavy concepts. But, you know, he pulls from psychoanalysis. Uh, it, he's Kernberg, and he works with Kernberg's notions of the subject and tries to put forward a notion that uh, that basically uh, in consumer, he's sort of making a historical periodization about the conditions of authority, which is very, very similar to what Adorno and Horkheimer were doing as well. Consumer capitalism was producing uh, an, a, a type of subjectivity which had a propensity, which had a tendency towards a type of um, fragmented uh, loss of narcissism. So it's not, it's not, this is, I think, the misunderstanding. The argument is not that a, a late capitalism or consumer capitalism is somehow a hedonistic um, panacea uh, 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 for which you have all of these kind of um, self-righteous, uh, pleasure-seeking uh, uh, consumers, right? Or, or No, the argument is rather that um, capitalism is, is um, producing a subject for which they cannot create boundaries for themselves, have a difficult time confronting stages of development, experience uh, their life without clear markers of progressing into adulthood. So there is a sense uh, uh, in Lash, which is something that's talked about quite a lot now, uh, that capitalism produces a kind of permanent adolescence. And Lash was concerned about the way that parts of the left in fact, celebrated um, youth culture and youth revolt, and that that fomented a, a type of um, uh, a set of of, of uh, challenges for politics, challenges for solidarity, challenges for the transmission of ideals, and a a, a promoted a sense of a skepticism about things like the family, which were being destroyed by the neoliberal uh, social policy reforms. So Lash is therefore perceived as a sort of conservative um, former socialist neocon, when in reality, I think he's trying to make a, uh, make a claim that the left should be able to talk about um, a subject, uh, should be able to talk about authority, should be able to talk about um a sense of boundaries, a sense of um, limits. I mean, one of the characteristics of a culture of narcissism, which I think we see uh, uh, these personality traits in many uh, of our of our family and friends, is a sense in which people cannot can no longer impose limits onto themselves. Right? There's there's a certain um, uh, incapacity of even the, the super ego in fact is weakened in some sense so it's it's actually uh not that um narcissism here is to be understood uh 
as a uh, again as a sort of free for all pleasure seeking hedonist thing no in fact the culture of narcissism is producing an a, a cruel and sadistic superego which is which of course by the way there are uh, in in freudian thought conceptions of superego which which are quite distinct from that which are different than that which i try to actually develop and track right because one of the things i try to to say is that the structure of consumer capitalism is is fomenting and is is accelerating this pernicious cruel persecutory sense of the superego and one of the effects that that has on us is that it shapes our imagination of otherness uh, uh, as persecutory cruel and as um, coming after us so like for example often it is the case when we when we talk and look at issues such as the fascism debate today uh, I don't know about you, but it seems to me often on the left, we have a tendency to uh, basically define anything right wing as fascist. I would argue that that is not reducible merely to a question of, uh, you know, like uh, uh, ideology, but rather this is also a psychic process of superego going on as well if that makes sense right this is this is beyond merely um some some bad form of thinking about how uh, conservatism is no it's it's actually structured uh based on the structure of 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 capitalist social relations and authority breaking down so lash is pointing out these things almost in the tradition of what you might call a jeremiah i don't know if you're familiar with this orientation of the Jeremiah is basically somebody who's offering a kind of warning signal to the culture and pointing to a future dystopia that's beginning to show signs. So therefore the reason that Lash possesses a certain popularity today is because he's writing about a society to come, which we now in a sense live with. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and uh, th there's much to be said about this, but I mean, that's, that's what I'll say at first. Um, I've interviewed on my program his daughter, Elizabeth Lash Quinn, who's also a historian doing very similar work to him. She's actually an expert on um, on race in America and has some really interesting, two interesting books on the history of race, which are very much worth looking at. Um, so I think Lash is quite misunderstood is, is, is one way to, to say it, but I don't know if you have any follow ups on that. Right. And I, I want to like first take off the Lacanian cap real quick and really kind of uh, circulate around what you were saying of Lash's uh, analytic background with Kernberg, because Kernberg was a relational uh, uh, analyst, if I'm not mistaken. But he really emphasizes that, uh, you know, we have affects first, you know, prior to drives and, you know, not to like get into uh, like debate like, oh, he's wrong about that. But if we take that sort of style and show how the development of narcissism is actually these sort of defense mechanisms from encountering the real uh, nature of what's going on in the unconscious, which is these contradictions of borderline or even psychosis. Mm. And we could see that with the dissolution of the, the father function or like the authority within Lash's understanding of the culture. And even maybe just the family in general, there's none of that development of affects so as we get older, socially, it's hard to be able to cope and deal with these modes of being in the world. And with the sort of dissolution of that, uh, let's say, paternal function, or as Lacan would say, you know, the name of the father, we are seeing a collective sort of uh, foreclosure going on. And this sort of narcissism, as you're saying, is not a hedonism. Um, it's rather an inability to maintain boundaries to produce boundaries and distinctions via the affects and therefore it's like socially we have a sort of battle with coming to grips with psychosis i don't know if you would yeah. agree with that that's 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 good that's fair a few points i wish to make one is it's a big and important question regarding when the uh, authority of the father is historically diminished in capitalism 
in reality, one of the things I've realized upon publishing my book, and you know, one of the things you do when you publish a book on a topic as immense as the family, right, is of course, inevitably you find other texts after you've published in which you think, ah, I, I should have included this. One of them is an incredible work called The Policing of Families by a scholar who was actually trained by Michel Foucault named Jacques Donzelot. And he points out in a quite convincing way that the erosion of the bourgeois mm, power of the father occurred during the time of, of Balzac. In other words, even, even in early industrial capitalism of the 1830s, you already see the um, coming dissolution, right? So we should be careful because there is a tendency for us to assign this uh, mutation. And Lash, one thing I would criticize in Lash is that he does uh, periodize uh, in a nostalgic way, which I, I talk about in the book as a criticism of him. I believe that Lash has a nostalgia for uh, the FDR period in America, right? Uh, the FDR period was interesting to him because it was a kind of achievement of a, a positive, egalitarian, bureaucratic, uh, sacrificial form of American social life. It was not neoliberal. It was not hyper-entrepreneurial. We uh, had the possibility for the creation of institutions for which our ideals might um, imbue those institutions with a degree of trust and so on. We, we had the possibility in the family more so uh, during the welfare state of a, of a, of a, um, uh, a healthy Oedipus. And by healthy Oedipus, all that we mean here is the paradoxical argument. It's very paradoxical, which has been hard for many people to understand, uh, which is that um, when a family structure is more stable, hmm, both materially, resource-wise, and less fragmented, less prone to precarity. Uh, the subjects, the children, ha can overcome the ambivalence of the attachments that they have to parents, which of course, in Freud's theory of Oedipus, the notion of Oedipus is that those attachments have to be worked through. They have to be transcended. Lash's culture of narcissism argues that starting in about the late 60s onward, as neoliberal policies intensify, that that material, the loss of material stability is fomenting a stunted Oedipal process in which, and what's the problem there? The problem is one of authority. Hmm? So it's not, it's not the problem that we need a strong patriarchy. It's that we need a family structure which is going to have more resources so that um, subjects can revolt uh, more adequately. In a sense, it's a rational theory of authority relations. It's it's not to say it's 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 paradoxical precisely because the it, this is something that Adorno talks about as well. When Wilhelm Reich says, when his lectures on psychoanalysis in the Soviet Union, right, he says, uh, in communism, Oedipus will wither. In communism, Oedipus as a family structure will wither, bourgeois family will wither. Hmm? Uh, and he the implication there would be that uh, the patriarchal bourgeois family um, is an impediment, a repressive impediment for allowing for its subjects to work through. And one, one thing that's very important to note there is that Reich in his Mass Psychology of Fascism text points out as well the notion that the family actually uh, is creating a subject possessing of character armor, possessing of a fascistic potential for which he's locating the causality of fascism in the bourgeois family because of its repressive apparatus. So that's a kind of 180 from the dynamics of what Adorno in the culture industry and Lash in culture of narcissism are locating for which both of them, by the way, in different ways, are saying, well, actually, implicit in the bourgeois family of yesteryear is a liberatory norm of more leisure time for the family, more exemption from labor, more stability, and therefore, 
a healthier uh, capacity to work through dependencies and to promote a sense of independence for the subjects. Because that's ultimately what Oedipus is about. It's a story of a development of subjective independence. Hmm? The conditions of neoliberal life, consumer capitalism, which we can we can talk about those distinctions, those those dynamics, are creating a a a, a significantly diminished capacity for that working through process. That's what he means by uh, the problem of the father. Now, if we pause and we think about how people might interpret that, you can see the misunderstanding that will emerge because the misunderstanding will be that, oh, well, he's saying that we need a, a return to the patriarchy, some kind of monstrous father thing to bring in authority to set down the law, which is actually not at all what he's really saying. And that's not also what Adorno is saying, right? So it's a very subtle and very ethical and very tricky conversation to have. But as you saw in the last conclusion, two chapters of my book, uh, I try to, to argue that if we don't have that conversation with socialist feminists and even with family abolitionists, right, then we're not really going to get anywhere on the left. Like, right? There's, there's a kind of split. Like the, the left is sort of a split subject, right? And I, I point to these two tendencies and I actually say that they both have a certain super egoic logic. There's not one super egoic logic of the left, like Todd McGowan says in his book. I think there's actually, mo there's multiple, right? Um, and I my, uh, my wager is that, like, if you like, I kind of want to be a man of peace <laughs> to sort of unite these two tendencies because I think that there's a tendency for both camps, which we can articulate these two camps. I get the idea from Mark Fisher as well. There's a tendency for both camps to perceive intense persecution one side to the other, right? So, uh, so this, yeah, I'll stop there. I, w I wanted to ask you, Daniel, um, apropos of, of the periodization of Oedipus, uh, the bourgeois family. In your book, you talk about how the older bourgeois Fordist ideal of the family, if I understood correctly, like ties the individual to a, a to capitalist reproduction through a kind of network of relations based on an edible guilt. But with the post Fordist model, this network is weakened, of course, by the decline of paternal authority that you're talking about. And this shift renders uh, shame the the operative affective mode of control can you elaborate on that point and how do um shame and guilt differ for you yeah. in this regard sure it's a it's a speculative point that i actually derive from the japanese marxist philosopher kojin karatani in particular although i also find it in lacan's reflections as well and the the simple point is that um the the period there that, that we can identify a certain periodization of a, of a general logic of familial authority in which there was a kind of repressive capacity of the family to inculcate a sense of guilt for which uh that itself had a certain instantiation of boundaries of uh, clear lines of transgression of yes no uh, you could say that things were um, more uh, in place in terms of the subjects passing way th passage through certain stages of development and overcoming and so on. It was going back to this Adorno point about, um, and I'm, I'm not saying we must be nostalgic for a return of a guilt-based subject. I'm not saying that. But I think what Lacan... Karatani and even Lash are all suggesting is that we're entering into a new type of social order in which is sometimes given the name of post prohibitory. And in a post prohibitory social order in which the injunction of familial authority has weakened significantly, right? You tend to deal with an affective bond that is of shame. Mm 
And it's no surprise that Lacan says that the discourse of the capitalist foments and, and accelerates a feeling of shame because shame is the affect, Lacan says, that is produced when you have an absence of a social link, an absence of a social bond. So therefore, shame is is the affect of a type of of a type of alienation. And uh, if you like, it's it's a way for me to 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 point to um, its its predominance in our world, right? For which I think there's many um, political symptoms of the proliferation of this affect of shame. And so to be able to name um, to name that, I think is important for politics, for our own um, literacy and understanding uh, affect theory as well, uh, but also to understand this kind of interesting dynamic. It's not to say that, of course, that we don't, uh, that we're post guilt. I think that would be far too strong of a claim. It's just rather that um, shame kind of plagues us more today than perhaps it ever has, right? And Lacan is very, I mean, we remember in seminar 17, this is one of Lacan's key points. Uh, uh, and it's also why uh, Lacan will say that the most important virtue to cultivate, um, and I think he's saying this with uh, attention to the contemporary, is the uh, is modesty, right? Because modesty is the affect which counterbalances shame, right? So in a, in a culture which is shame inducing, shame producing, Lacan stands for modesty, which is very um, ironic, given that we always think of Lacan as some kind of bombastic person. No, he's actually saying. He's saying we need to cultivate a lot more modesty in the face of these dynamics. Um, so, so yeah, so shame is is sort of that um, that affect for for which, um, yeah, because uh, I think that that our institutions from colleges, universities, corporations, the family, all the way down, um, make us. Uh, 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 propel us into a state of a kind of abandonment a lot, right? There, there is that, that tendency. So, uh, so I, I try to, I try to track what that, um, what the effects of that might be. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I try to, to say is that again, it leads to this kind of crisis of authority and the development of what I named the social, the social superego which I suppose we could we could elaborate a little more about that concept if you guys would like. Yeah, actually, I, I wanted to ask you because I believe on the um, Machinic Unconscious podcast episode you did, you said that you're not the biggest fan of the concept of the, the big other. And I, I wanted to know, why you choose to opt for this concept of the social superego and how it you feel it may be more efficacious. Yeah. Well, I mean, for a couple of reasons. One is I felt that Lacan's notion of the big other, um, it's always been a question in Lacan's um, suspicion of historicism, in his suspicion of... Uh, applying the concept of a history of the big other. Very few people have actually done that in the Lacanian field. Of course, it's possible. It's possible. Um, Jacqueline Miller has indicated some. Arik Laurent has indicated some uh, movement in that direction. There's some interesting work about uh, the status of the big other in ancient Greece by different Lacanian scholars. There is some interesting work on Lacan's theory of the big other in the Middle Ages. So you can do this. Um, however, I do find uh, that the concept is distinct from the Freudian notion of the superego. And I find that there's a lot more literature and references to uh, the superego. And it, 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 it therefore it piqued my interest also, because you'll notice in the text, I try to point out that uh, the superego is itself inextricable from Marxism and from communism. And that may sound very strange for me to say that, but let me explain why. Um, 
Well, because when Freud invented the concept of superego, it was in the shadow, in the immediate proximity to the Bolshevik revolution of 1917. So literally that event, that world historical communist event, one of the most significant events since 1848, Paris Commune, 1917, Freud is a Jewish scientist uh, writing basically next door to this event. He's facing a profound pressure from bourgeois social scientists in his milieu in Vienna who are saying to him, do your concepts have a certain implicit solidarity with communism? Is your conception of the law an antinomian one? Uh, is your conception of the social law uh, one that is congruent with the dictatorship of the proletariat? Those things are, are of pr promoting a lot of anxiety for bourgeois social scientists because uh, what if what if Germany has a successful proletarian revolution, which of course they tried, right? So it's at this time that Freud uh, develops his conception of super the superego, hmm? through the pressure, especially of the liberal jurist Hans Kelsen. So you could say, in in a sense, Freud develops the superego as a kind of um, compromise with with liberalism to come up with a theory of the social law in some sense. Okay, so that's a little bit of historical background about the development of the of the concept, and of course, I referenced the essay by Etienne Balibar called The Invention of the Superego in my chapter three, which I highly recommend you look at. But in essence, um, one of the things that Freud indicates in later refinement of the concept is that uh, the superego should be thought of also as a socialized phenomenon. In other words, it, it opens up an archaic relationship to the law, which is internalized by the subject, but which is also found imminently within the mode of production of capitalist social order. So the social superego is therefore um, housed outside of the bourgeois family. It's housed imminent to the, the, the mode of production itself. And that to me is an extremely uh, powerful idea because what it means is that um, it's extraordinarily difficult to transcend this pernicious form of superego and what the social bonds of consumer capitalism do if they're weakening uh, localized familial or communi communal forms of superego. What you have is the kind of envelop envelopment of, of a type of um, pernicious socialized version of authority which uh, usurps the subject's own uh, capacity to overcome it. So we kind of get drowned out. And this is one thing that Lash wrote about quite a lot. And again, this is something that kind of affects our sense of feeling ultra persecuted. It affects our sense of dealing with otherness. It affects, I would even say things like cancel culture, the the tendency towards purity, the, the tendency towards... Um, suspicion towards others, the tetendency to exaggerate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are the effects of an unhinged superego. But again, the reason I like social superego as a concept is because it points to A, this uh, type of finance, capitalist, post-welfare state, breaking of social bonds, fragmented dynamic of kind of authority which is acephalic that's a good term it's a it's a good word acephalic which means headless it's headless law right uh and what it also means is that you you therefore politically need to bring in a master to compensate in the context of the social superego which is a good way to understand phenomena like populism Phenomena like Trump, phenomena whereby actually what we want to do to punish our enemies is to align ourselves with somebody who will be perceived by our enemies as ultra powerful, 
and maybe ultra perverse. So it leads to a type of perverse politics as well, right? Right. So we we latch on to these figures of perversity in the face of the social superego. So these are the reasons why I find it useful to speak of it in this way, because with the notion of the big other, I haven't yet seen the same type of periodization that helps me think of the difference that emerges in our social relations and political life from, say, the welfare state to this new world we live in now. And I think social superego kind of gives me the language to, 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 to point to these dynamics. Right. Does that no. make sense, Joel? No? Yeah, that definitely. Yeah. And I remember you, you said both in, in the machinic and um, those at Lacan in Scotland of uh, how you prefer the super ego, social superego over the big other. Right. Um, now, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to fall into a semantical right. thing where we, we create a kind of um, theoretical spade to spade or debate. I, I actually don't think that there's too much of a substantive debate it's <laughs> it's what is the, the objective is rather right. to to work with the concepts to uh, m uh, help us explain social phenomena so that we have a, a sort of greater capacity to locate and name uh, shared experiences uh to uh, all i mean that's ultimately kind of what i think psychoanalysis brings to the field of of political life right a kind Absolutely. of clarity onto onto the unthought, <laughs> unconscious attachments that hold us down, that prevent solidarity, that prevent us uh, from progressing in certain in certain vital ways. Right. Um, one of the things I uh, wanted to kind of get some clarity on is because you evoke um, the concepts from like Bordeaux, um, for instance, in the symbolic exchange, uh, the alchemy of it, as, as, as you ordered it, um, are these the sort of things that sort of help work through, um, you know, the, the child within the family to kind of gain that sort of affective ground to operate? But because of the breakdown of that and the dissolution of the family, the compensation from the institutions or the market economy take rise, but it's hard to grapple with because, again, to, to repeat, there isn't this sort of... Uh, work through of Oedipus uh, or, or the, the affects and stuff like that. So that's why we end up uh, feeling shame or as you're saying, as far as uh, the social superego, we uh, compensate for like perverse politics, perverse or like just um, persecutory, you know, acts, etc. Yeah. So uh, Pierre Bourdieu wrote a very interesting work on the family. He's a French sociologist who had a great, degree of sympathy with 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 marxism himself um in my second chapter i i try to to show that um he he allows us to see something different than the logic of authority which the social superego and these and oedipus names so i br incorporate Bourdieu to to address something slightly different which is that i believe he actually helps us really understand the ideological function of a family really well in this notion of what he calls the family spirit and the the notion of ideology actually may surprise you is very close to even Zizekian um fetishist disavowal it's close because his what he says is that the function of the family is to uh, make a taboo on making explicit the family's own complicity with the field of social reproductive labor. In other words, the very interesting thing about a family is that at a certain point, its own symbolic exchange laws that compose its coherence to itself, to itself, to its members, uh, must be based on the, the, the ideology that it, the family is separate from the economic sphere. In fact, if the family uh, had to face the real of the fact that it's preparing its subjects to go into Amazon jobs, to go into the factories, to go in, I claim, and I think Bourdieu claims as well, this would be too monstrous of a, of a, of a, of a proposition. I mean, it would be a kind of nihilist family, right? I mean, could you think of anything more 
I mean, this is actually the paradox of the working class family, because the working class family is faced with the real of, of the productive process to, to an extent greater than the middle class family is. Yeah. So in that sense, the family paradoxically becomes becomes much more um, uh, a, a site for value in itself, right? For value in itself. And this is something that we've seen. Um, ever since the very invention of the bourgeois family in the 19th century, because slowly proletarian struggle, labor struggles, fought for the family to be a more egalitarian, fought for for working class family to have more free time, for working class women to have their labor paid for. That was a whole movement in 1960s, 70s, Italian socialist feminism called Wages for Housework. Very important movement. Um, of course, in somewhere like the United States, we would never dream of compensating the labor of a housewife, right? Um, but nonetheless, it's a it's a very brilliant political demand, in my view, which we should we should probably resurrect, in my view. But nonetheless, uh, Bourdieu's notion of family spirit basically says that it says uh, a family creates an ideology which uh, is classed. In the sense that if it's a bourgeois family, its ideology it must be one in which there's a kind of um, a disavowal of its own complicity with the labor market. Now, one of the things that's happened that's very important in the neoliberal period, though, is that that family spirit of the bourgeois family, which is, again, based on going back to Adorno and Lash. A paradoxically, or maybe let paradox, let's say surprising, on a surprising liberatory promise, which is the promise of free time and leisure for its members. A politics of leisure time is a radical politics. That's a radical politics. We often forget how radical it is because capitalism can't meet that demand. Capitalism needs us all to work all the time, right? Politics of leisure is like something we should be talking about a lot more. And I know that our our good friend, um, Theory Plebe, in his notion of time energy, uh, uh, although he's not Theory Plebe, Theory Underground, um, time energy, right? This is this is this is the the heart of 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 socialist politics. So anyway, so Bourdieu gives us this notion. However, you know the. Neoliberal family now is lost touch with those those implicit promises of the bourgeois family. The neoliberal family is now its imagination, is a proletarianized imagination, which is very perverse. Because what that means is that it's an easy out for the middle class bourgeois family because they can all pretend, everyone can pretend. Uh, it, rather, there's no longer a need to make a taboo on that uh, explicit connection. It's almost now that like, and I, I, I discussed this in my last chapter when I examined the popular TV show Roseanne in the reboot of Roseanne. Hmm? What a monstrous uh, thing. I don't know if you guys saw the reboot of Roseanne. You didn't see it? Oh my God. It's like, uh, <laughs> well, we can talk about it, but because, you know, Roseanne in the 90s kind of was like, it was a working class family, but like it was chill and like it was stable and like people were relaxed. But like in the reboot, they're all in their like 30s and 40s, still living at home. The kids um, not able to marry, not able to socially reproduce, working three jobs, mm -hmm. having to sell their eggs. The woman selling her eggs for extra money. The father, Dan Connor, is like doing full gig economy. And of course, he has no labor union uh, connections at all. So he's like, his politics are pretty much reactionary, right? And and the whole show actually, in a weird sense, gets canceled because of ac accusations of racism. But the racism that it, it goes on is almost like a um, projection of the horror that they're facing from proletarianization, right? It's almost like the horror of proletarianization is too hard to face on it, on it straight on. So they they kind of use the clutch of racism over here. It's you haven't seen it, so we can't really talk about it. But what what we're seeing now is even middle class 
is losing the the because one of the promises of the bourgeois family was well women should be exempt from work right and especially women at a certain age right and you never see that advocacy you never see that in fact if one were to advocate that you we all know what the they would be accused of right it's a taboo to even make such a a wager or advocacy right so we're in a very difficult situation on the one hand we can't resurrect an old form that's not how like that's like why the politics of nostalgia doesn't work and actually can produce a type of incoherence right so we need to sort of this is what i tried to do towards the end of my book right is to sort of um develop a kind of new form of of what a family might look like beyond these things with full understanding that yes implicit in these old forms even the bourgeois family are some quite radical proposals actually right especially the leisure time piece right right and i I really want to emphasize that more because i think now i mean you've are definitely way more immersed in um you know the the different marxist literature than uh you know nick and i and you know i for an extent of been like more like influenced by like althusser and just reading marx himself and some lukash but um this like notion of of leisure and politics i think is kind of important because it seems like there is this nostalgia not only for like a sort of uh conservative type of politics but even on the left of like mo- most marxists i would say of wanting to ad- adhere to the purely leninist um conception and i think you point this out with uh in the last chapter um talking about mark fisher's uh criticisms of this leninist super ego which is always about milita- militarized revolution but never one of you know okay after that then we have this sort of leisure time and peace solidarity and and, you know sort of commune right it's more of a communize and revolutionize but we don't do that um and i think that's kind of interesting because i think you're saying something about how a super ego like that's more along the lines of let's say being able to enjoy and and enjoy in the leisure sense not like sort of the jouissance of lacan uh is something that's i guess you would say something to achieve more and would that kind of align with your whole notion of the superego as liberation yeah i mean that's so one of the things that marxist let's say freudian marxism has been um a riddle that lenin put down for freudian marxism uh, emerges in a comment that lenin once made regarding um how revolutionaries ought to listen to music (laughs) kind of a funny idea um but literally like he basically made a comment regarding the enjoyment of fine music like opera and he said that well you 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 must not allow for moments of great ecstasy and pleasure to override your commitment to revolutionary activity so therefore Everyone has said, well, Lenin is promoting a type of asceticism, right? The politics that if you are going to be a revolutionary thinker, activist, forget the word activist, that's highly problematic, uh, militant, we could use this term perhaps, um, kind of a French term, but nonetheless, it's it's fine. Uh, you therefore need a kind of moderation, but a radical moderation in Lenin's sense. Therefore, the, there is a tendency on the left to double down on that radical asceticism, the consequence of which is that politics becomes devoid of pleasure and joy making. And the other and then and then therefore a super egoic structure could even be thought of as emerging around such a orientation. We, we can identify groups and tendencies that congeal in such a way. And I think that as I'm saying this, you may even be thinking of groups that fit within this broader category or tendency. I then point out that there's another tendency, which is um, 
saying actually the art of politics is one of the inculcation of joy in the act of trying to revolutionize society. That in fact, culture and the field of culture itself must be thought of as an imminent site for the creation of what the future society will be. And therefore, on the left, we need to open an invitation into a constant, and this is where the communal living thing would come. It's not to say that communal living will, in some utopian socialist, um, like foyer or like, uh, you know, these kind of 19th century communes or even new left communes, which we should be honest, haven't succeeded. In fact, the new left communes and experiments in abol abolishing the bourgeois family, uh, we should be sober and honest that they didn't succeed at all. In fact, uh, I have an article coming out soon, which is looking at that legacy. And I think that we should be very critical about that legacy because one of the errors of it, in my view, is the fact that we thought of the commune form of the family as somehow capable of rivaling the nuclear patriarchal bourgeois form of the family. I actually argue through a great socialist feminist writer called Ellen Wills that the conditions of neoliberal social life are making that even more difficult than it was during the new left. I mean, at the time of the new left, because of the marginal tax rate and because of redistributive politi uh, policies, you could do these experiments. You could you could you could you could check out as a, as they use the phrase you could check out for five six years you could uh, uh, exit the meritocratic rat race that we all have to enter hmm? now tell me what happens if you exit the meritocratic rat race we all know what happens it's not pretty right it's not easy drugs life expectancy goes way down health issues it's life of depravity. I only say this because of firsthand experience with my own family. I know what that looks like. So we need to be very clear that experimenting in the commune, uh, if we're serious with this, we don't want it to be a reified middle-class fantasy. Hmm? We have to think about broad working-class-based solidarity politics that transcends all of liberal constructs around race and all of their fantasies about that and actually promotes uh, an insane countervailing force to hegemonic liberalism. We can talk about what that might look like. I have many thoughts on that, but lo and behold, if the family, if these institutions that we live in are able to reintroduce redistributive, let's put it this way, if socialists in the West come to power and they succeed only a little bit, that itself will be one of the most radical gestures we could have in our lifetime because it will open the door and people will start to turn their heads and look differently. So therefore, we need to be very clear of, and very modest about what where we're at on the left and even like making some inroads with small things could be potentially quite large, quite, quite huge. So that's kind of some of my vision of, of how I think about these things. Um, but again, to go back, it's these kind of, it's these kind of two tendencies, a politics of joy and a politics of asceticism. And the important thing is that furthermore, they end up often rivaling one another. So we have a kind of grand Oedipal rivalry amongst ourselves. And my argument is that we must reject this rivalry. This is kind of the politics of the psych psychoanalysis of the politics of the family 101. Rivalry is at the center of it, which is why I center the concept of initiation so much and why I'm interested in Girard, right? Because Girard, I think, is an interesting thinker on the dynamics of rivalry. So we could chat about that as well, because I think rivalry is like, probably one of the most accessible ways into understanding what the politics of Oedipus basically is at the end of the day.
Um, in connection with this taboo against uh, making explicit the family's role is almost like this incubator of a subject of capitalist reproduction. How can we connect that with, I forget which chapter it is, but um, where you talk about the internalization of the superego injunction and how the capitalist discourse leads to a confusion of desire and demand and under capitalism in late stage capitalism the subject is sort of almost we could say maybe coerced into um misrecognizing their yeah desire is like a baffled demand I think that's fair. Although I will say this, I think that Lacan's theory of the discourse of the capitalist, which you were kind of alluding to there, I find very powerful, but also limited. Because ultimately, one of the things that we're told in this very intricate formula that he gives us with the math themes and um, how uh, it's basically a story about how the constitutive splitness of our subjectivity um, is is irresolved by capitalism that there that, and this is something that Freud said in civilization is discontent mm -hmm. that capitalism leaves us with an unsatisfied desire and Lacan shows that um because the commodity is the stand-in for the s1 for the resolution supposed resolution of the split subjects demands going back to this yeah. constitutional split between desire and demand uh it leaves the subject unrepaired uh, in some sense. It leaves the subject in abeyance. And so the solution is always for more, always for more. And this, this comes from, this is the origin of the notion of the surplus jouissance, uh, which is, which, which actually produces a frustrated subject. And this is obvious. I mean, it's very simple. Just go home and talk to your, Brothers and sisters, your friends, people are extremely um, edgy and frustrated in this society. It's no, it's no shock. And moreover, the social trust that we have in this commodity process of like trusting in these institutions, trusting in this course I'm going to take, trusting in it's breaking down in the sense that it's unclear what they're going to deliver for us, what's going to be satisfied. So we go into these commodity exchange relations. We consume the programs with a lot of skepticism, even going into them. That wasn't always the case. That wasn't always the case. Again, going back to this welfare state notion, this Lashian nostalgia, which we should be careful of. I think that it's fair to say there was a moment in time in which um the investments that we had in social figures of authority and so on had a certain uh you know a, a certain fluidity which which i think is now um fraying at the edges is mm -hmm. what i would say about that and therefore for the family spirit it itself is now uh facing facing these realities in in a way which ha it forces the family i think any family to kind of come up with different strategies for um for care for joy for and and of course families do because there's a great sociologist who did a macro study of the structure of the family throughout the 20th century uh goran thirborn a great marxist sociologist and he says that uh, despite all of the radical um, changes in capitalism during the 20th century, Chinese Cultural Revolution, 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, the two wars, introduction of neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera. He basically shows that the family structure remained, A, extremely um, popular democratically. Like, for example, right now, millennials... Uh, are somewhat something like like 90% of of people like whatever our age or younger I don't know if you guys 
are too young to be millennials exactly, but even young people are like, see their life as only being complete if on condition that they're able to do a family, to start a family, right? Moreover, I don't know if you knew this, but the promises of the sexual revolution from the 60s and 70s have now actually created dynamics where the majority of people who get divorced in America, you know what the number one reason they cite for getting divorced? It's lack of emotional connection, which actually indicates, if you read a great book called The End of Love by Eva Aluz, it actually indicates, according to her, uh, that there's a certain paradox going on in, in marriage and families today, which is that we have a kind of egalitarian possibility that has never quite been as much present today as we had, which is the fact that we now center emotional, she says, the center of marriage and relationships before the family, the possibility of just having a life partner is all centered around emotional resilience and emotional strength and emotional, like in surveys of women that are um, heterosexual women seeking men, they say even more important than a man who can provide for me is a man who has emotional depth, emotional maturity, et cetera. And so it's strange though, because at the same time, the promises of what it means to actually be somebody that can elevate to that level of emotional maturity for a woman is now split by class in ways which we haven't seen for decades. And so we're now seeing like a huge tendency amongst working class young people, even though they really want to have families, they, they're not able, able to do it. They're not able to do it because of the economic crises that, that we're facing. This is creating like a really quiet suffering, a quiet strain in our social life. I know I'm kind of going far afield from your question now, but I feel like maybe it's related um, because I think that's what we should be talking about, which is like, what do these dynamics look like, especially after COVID for young people who are facing the reality that marriage and family is actually a source of a profound um sustenance a profound it's just, it's a desire that people have there's there's no escape from that um in fact actually in non-heteronormative families say people that are gay did you know that like 93 percent of gay uh, marriages say that they married for love whereas like i, I don't know i think it's like 70 percent for for non-homosexuals so uh the promises of the sexual revolution have made the, the promise of marriage and families uh, more egalitarian seeming, more egalitarian seeming, but more inaccessible for large swaths of people. And that's, that's a real crisis. That's a real crisis that we can't really, that we don't talk about enough, I feel. Brilliant. Thanks. Andrew? Yeah. Um, so uh, that was a lot of a lot of good stuff. Um, I th think I want to ask more because I'm kind of interested in, and I know Nick is as well, with um, both your, I would say, interest in anti Oedipus as both the critique of you know the the family and and its play in the capitalism, but also in which uh, there is a limit to. D and G and where their project failed. Because one thing that I found interesting is how you, you in describing their sort of way of deterritorialization and line of flight, that there is this rebellion to not cohere to these series of identifications, right? Ego ideal, ideal ego. And so these sort of group formations are supposed to be identifying with the sign, right? And that was something I was kind of confused about. Can you elaborate that more as well? And also pretty much my question of where do you see D and G being relevant and where they fail? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, good question. Uh, so the Los Anguatari put forward a libertine critique of, of the bourgeois family and their 
the presupposition, there's there's some uh, presuppositions going on that I think when we read that text, which of course should be read as a text which goes on for about 25 years, um, right, from the early 70s um, to the 90s, right, has different iterations. And it is thought of as both a kind of revolt against some of the what they perceive as the stultifying or even overly authoritarian directions of Lacanian psychoanalysis, as well as a new critique for, for a new direction of Marxism, for which, importantly, they are opposed to socialism. They are opposed to the party form. They are... Um, sympathetic to Marx, but coming at Marx very much from an anarchist oriented point of view. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to sort of do a whole new reappraisal on the whole corpus of Freud's social writings. And, um, and so therefore, they can be thought of in line with Marxist historical materialism, because chapter three of anti Oedipus looks at uh, uh, history in a completely new way, right? Um, their, their, their starting point, is to say, well, Freud's disciple Wilhelm Reich gives us the greatest materialist form of thinking the unconscious as bound up with social uh, production. And therefore, um, we can redefine desire um, as bound up with sociality itself and redefine, therefore, the subject's relationship to the social field itself. So, D and G are quite complex because what they do is they upend all of our common assumptions about how psychoanalysis in fact works. They they reorient the distinction between drive and desire in a completely different way than is supposed to be understood. So you have to understand all of these provisos and caveats when you go into their work. And we don't have the time to develop all of those distinctions that they make. But if we just look at it from a slightly higher vantage point and we ask the question, regarding um, how they treated the family as a category, I do think that there's some blind spots at work in their project. And the main one is that I believe that, uh, and Deleuze confesses this in later reflections in the before he died, when he's old, older, uh, is that they they tried to conceive of a, of a um, libertine escape entirely from the metaphysical capture of Oedipus. And I believe in, in short sense that that model cannot realistically be replicated. The only basis by which that can actually occur is the basis of confronting a bourgeois family of an older form. But now we have this neoliberal proletarianized family and you tell me what it would practically mean to treat the family in this way. Well, practically, it would be a kind of um, um, an infantile politics, which would uh, leave subjects bereft of any. So the family now is stretched so thin materially, resource wise, uh, that that kind of libertine politics isn't interesting to me. It doesn't it doesn't produce. Uh, we need we need to almost revisit their project <laughs> at a different sequence of socialist struggle than we're currently at, if that makes sense. I think we need to actually retain, and that's why they have a very interesting critique ultimately of identity, and that goes back to that notion of how they're locating, because what of what they're trying to do is create a new Kantian. A schema of analysis of how desire is generated and how repression is generated in capitalism so as to think of a subjectivity that can subvert can get outside of that repressive hold so it's a very noble intention it's a very noble intention for which they clearly align with that tendency i mentioned before of the joyful libertine mode of revolt, mode of liberation. And therefore, they must be read in line with Wilhelm Reich, in line with Herbert Marcuse, in line with a certain tendency. They are our comrades. They should not be seen as some kind of 
I mean, this is the problem with Christopher Lash. He once wrote an essay against them where he basically said these are infantile leftists and they're all they're just doing great damage and so on. I think this is a foolish way to treat the situation. It's the same. It would be like me saying that Sophie Lewis, the family abolitionist, is I would never call her foolish like that. That would be shooting myself in the foot because we share a common vision. This goes back to the propensity to create these kind of persecutory enemies, which I'm opposed to. You know what I mean? So all I'm saying is that there's limits to their project. I don't find it as relevant. And I also think that the whole basis of their critique of against psychoanalysis um, is very interesting because their critique of psychoanalysis as an institution was basically very, uh, uh, it was very obvious that psychoanalysis had a great cultural and institutional power that today it doesn't it doesn't have nearly as much when when the three of us were at the um duquesne lacan conference clinic and culture remember a few months ago someone alex colston shared a statistic about the number of Lac practicing lacanian analysts in the united states you guys remember what the number was it's something like okay it's something like under five thousand in the United States, right? So we should be sober and modest. And so when the and Guattari say in Anti-Oedipus, they set up the figure of the psychoanalyst as a new priest, that doesn't make sense today. That just doesn't, it doesn't fit our realities. And and I try to show in the book that the Lo's uh, recognize that and he tried to invent a completely new account of where power is headed yeah so all of that is to say don't ignore Deleuze and Guattari don't see them as your adversary learn from them but maybe there is some dated limitations based on the changing dynamics right and that's interesting too because like from what I'm getting, it seems like even though they're critiquing psychoanalysis, it's mainly Freud. And when they're bringing Lacanian theory into it, it seems like they're really bashing at Leclerc more than Lacan. And from my understanding, I don't really think they attended much of the later seminars of Lacan, right? Especially like maybe like Seminar 17, where he's more focused on the social links of these discourses. Um, yeah, yeah. Going yeah. beyond Oedipus as well. <laughs> well, yeah, no, Deleuze, Lacan invited Deleuze to his office once and said, will you will you uh become one of my close my close disciples and and long story short Deleuze basically uh rejected his offer so they did they did have a split but the publication of anti-oedipus was very influential for Lacan and there is work essays written about even the later elaborations of certain Lacanian concepts from encore onwards do indicate that he was drawing inspiration at least in some sense from what the Lozenguatri had put down so it was a it was a milieu in which i think there was a lot of intellectual um quiet intellectual influences going on both ways and i don't think that they are anti-lacanians at all although uh, when they created that experimental university in Benzhen, there was definitely talk of um, Lacan's kind of dictatorial, administrative, uh, ma making some errors in terms of how he ran institutions. Lacan was um, definitely a maverick, I think, when it came to how he sought institutions, right? I mean, this is this is a guy who decided to dissolve his own institution, right? Um, this is someone who was highly independent, right? Um, but it's, he's also someone who taught Marxists a lot about what an institution is, in some sense. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of um, respect for both endeavors. And even one of the best ways to know that is to read someone like Alain Badiou, and his reflections on that history, where he will show that what we often look on French theory as kind of splits and 
fights and sectarianism and so on. He portrays with a lot more, with a lot more, let's say, implicit solidarity than we may assume. I'm I'm curious, uh, Daniel, as to um, what you make of this comment from Gerard about anti Oedipus. Uh, I believe you in the book say that you agree with his take, which is that their project actually leads to an intensification of castration. What do you what do you think he meant by that? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a good it's a good one. I think first of all, Rene Girard wrote what I consider to be one of the most interesting and substantive book reviews and kind of critical essays on anti-Oedipus, the first one, not Thousand Plateaus, but the first installment. And basically his argument was that um, close to my own general critique, which is that in the Lozenguatri's conception, um, they're uh, not getting at the heart of overcoming this crisis of the double bind, which for Gerard, Oedipus can be traced back to the condition which he ultimately locates as a problem of modernity, of capitalist modernity itself, which is that the paternal law, the structure of the bourgeois family, is composed upon... Uh, a father which has a contradictory yes and a no, right? This is the famous Gregory Batson notion of the double bind. And so he basically says that their strategy for transcending this situation leaves the subject uh, bereft of having truly overcome or even having faced the reality of this. So he says that it kind of leads to a kind of nomadic homeless subject who has in a sense kind of kept this this situation and not overcome the the rock of castration precisely because they've they've tried to construct a a line of flight in a complete avoidance of it in some sense so it, he thinks that their project conceptually to summarize it's a very rich review i can so I cited I cited in my text on the chapter on Gerard, which again I highly recommend everyone read. It's translated into English, and so he says basically that their conceptual apparatus uh, is faulty. But I mean, look, Gerard also says that Freud's understanding of Oedipus is faulty as well. So uh, there's no winners there. I mean, except for him, of course, right? Um, I mean, because Gerard's a person who puts forward a notion that. Um, there is an unconscious mechanism, uh, but which is not tied into the same drive structure. So he kind of gives us a sense of a de-biologized conception of the double bind and the rivalry of Oedipus, right? Without all of the fancy beyond the pleasure principle categories that Freud develops. And nor does Girard need to use the Saussurian structure of the signifier system that Lacan develops. No, he thinks he can come at it from a completely different different way. Uh, we don't have the time to get into Girard's proposal, um, but it's certainly worth looking at how he how he conceives of, of, of rivalry and of Oedipus because he says that Freud is correct to locate this. But he says that Freud's solutions to overcoming it remain inadequate. And he, he basically says that uh, he kind of gives a cheap shot against Freud, saying that Freud does want to preserve uh, the father, and which I think his reading of Freud is, is wrong and problematic. And I also think that practically speaking, if I, if I might, I think Gerard's uh, system of thought leads to a type of... <laughs> a type of libertarianism, a type of, because, you know, he's a weird, he's a weird figure. He's, uh, 
he's against capitalism because he thinks that capitalism uh, creates a psychic suffering because of competition, right? So he really thinks that competition is what um, sparks this rivalrous mimetic desire process for which we need to create institutions to circumvent that in some sense, which is why he's a kind of Catholic pro-empire, which is why he was, I think, in some sense, um, I think his politics fall in line with that kind of uh, old church, higher, necessary hierarchy at all times. It's a very, very like elitist thing. And it's no surprise that Peter Thiel is so drawn to Gerard because Peter Thiel is, uh, Gerard is a kind of philosopher of advanced monopoly capitalism, where you have these kind of fiefdoms that shelter themselves off and what's interesting about them and this is why i say in the last chapter that gerard could actually be thought of within a family because i think that actually practically speaking if you just look at like the local interpersonal group dynamics of mimetic desire like within a small group like a family or a corporation there's a lot of cool stuff that he can kind of point to how to end rivalry, how to mitigate violence, how to uh, promote understanding, things like that. But ultimately, it, what we're left with is a vision in which no, this is this is something that bothers me. Uh, no, so, no, no proper treatment of social antagonism. Anyone who identifies a politics based on an enemy hmm, is problematic because they're reproducing the scapegoat. So that's why he says, Freudianism and Marxism both produce scapegoat logics. And that's actually a really interesting debate because Todd McGowan is saying something kind of similar. I wonder if you guys saw this in his new book with Sublation Press, where his basic premise is uh, left-wing politics must abandon the, the conception of the external enemy in some ways. That's something we should really discuss because... I worry about that tendency. I mean, it's the same reason I I question my socialist comrades who say that, um, well, there is no ruling class anymore. Hmm? Like some people actually think that. Or class politics will foment rivalrous resentment politics because it'll turn, you know, working class against middle class or something like this. I don't know about you all, but my feeling is that um, we must affirm that like rationally speaking, there are enemies in this world that need to be addressed and isolated, knowing full well that doing so doesn't always have to lead to some kind of hysterical situation, you know? So this is something, this is maybe for another time, this is something, a real debate that we should have um, on the question of like, what is an enemy? Well, uh, you know, I've been going kind of far afield from your thing, but I've been basically Gerard's Gerard's critique of anti-Oedipus is worth looking at. That's is what I'm going to say. It's very interesting. I have a tendency to kind of give you a lot in my question in my answers. I uh, hopefully you you appreciate it. No, better, better more than yeah less. And I haven't checked out Todd's new work. It's it's the uh, enjoying right and the left one, right? Yeah, no, it's a great, yeah. it's great, I've, it's great I've read work. Some of it, it's, it's a really great work. Good. Don't get me wrong. I think it's excellent. I think it's excellent. It's just a really interesting debate that we need that he raises that we need to have about this question. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Right. And then that could be from his like sort of Hegelianism where he's not really interested. Well, he I would say he is to an extent in dialogue with with Marx, but he is in dialogue in cap with capitalism and like the sort of Hegelian sense. But it does make sense for like, you know, uh us like marxists and stuff because as zizekian as i am i still love the marxist tradition i just have to be more critical of it because i think you're right in pointing that out that there is this sort of question that has not been addressed like what is the enemy and who is it if we could address that uh like an enemy does exist and because of that we have this sort of internalized persecution well and yeah i mean look look at look at the contemporary discourse on the enemy uh the pmc discourse you know i mean we all know that its pitfalls are pretty obvious pretty apparent or they should be right which is that 
the you know the notion of taking on the professional managerial class as your primary enemy leaves you in a, a tricky boat because on the one hand you are essentializing people for whom within that class are going to be some of your best uh, partners of comrades and solidarity which you will right. need which you right. will need uh uh if you're if because they have access to resources they have access to institutions etc cetera, etc cetera. right yeah. this is what theory plea or theory underground is doing right now to kind of address that like you know with the pmc take it's not an essentialized thing or exactly. like a sort of um exactly what is it uh people like to say it's like a derogatory term you know right because like, he's somebody. sort of advocating a, a, a reckoning with the uh ideological aspects of being pmc rather than isolating the pmc as as enemies and you know kind of like creating a monster in the process it's more of a you know generalized working through of what what it means to have a mentality conditioned by the pmc yeah, that's a super, very, very central distinction. But it, on social media, in events, there is a tendency to hysteric or there's a tendency uh, to calcify a sense of uh, a false rivalry. So however we construe that ideological mm -hmm. battlefield um, requires still a lot of thinking, a lot of work. Right. It takes it takes a lot to clarify the lines, because, I mean, in my uh, program with Catherine Liu on my podcast, um, watch that one, by the way, it was really good. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, you know, really you know, but, you know, but she's accusing me uh, at certain points of like acting PMC. Right. Because I was trying to at one point I was trying to. Um, what was it? Uh, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Catherine gave the point of view. Or she could give the point of view, perhaps. Yeah, I can, I can. I want to debate with her again. I think she's a great. She's very important intellectual in my view. In my view, um, you know, this whole thing I'm trying to say of like make peace between like family abolitionists and like social democracy left wing populists. Yeah, I don't think Catherine would agree with that, right? Because sometimes that anti PMC politics doesn't, in my opinion, see that. Uh, what we need to do is collapse the false sense of rivalry that's been imposed upon us on the left. And that if we can see actually some kind of um, lifting of these supposed ideological barriers and differences between us, that, that those need to be transcended as opposed to further reinforced. And often some anti-PMC folks want to further entrench and further reinforce them so as to to foment a politics of more shame, a politics that that isolates more, you know, there's some dangers with that. I mean, sure, it feels good to to call people out for hypocrisy, but that doesn't really achieve anything. I would much rather uh, to use the language of family abolition people for a moment, focus on a radical politics of repair. I don't know if you guys are aware. Are you aware of this turn to reparative studies? It's a very important thing in left-wing academia these days. Came out of this thing during the like 80s and 90s, Eve Sedgwick. I don't know if you're familiar with it, where she argued that no longer do we need to think about critique, critiquing society, critiquing social structures, critiquing power. We need to actually start to move away from critique because critique hasn't done anything for the least advantaged, hasn't done anything for us, hasn't produced much. And she says we need to adopt what she calls um, a method of a reparative approach, right? And anyway, so long story short, one of the really helpful ways for those of us that are not like directly in contemporary academia sometimes interesting because we see what's going on in academia as almost like crazy sometimes or like let's say very out of touch with the uh, common concerns of working class people that's obvious yeah well one of the ways that that is expressed is through the reparative turn 
There's a great book on this, by the way, called The Ruse of Repair, which actually shows that this discourse on repair has actually been very detrimental when we look at anti-imperialist struggles and the way that they bring that language of repair into anti-war and anti-imperialist struggle, especially in South America, because they basically are saying that you can, you are kind of permitted as an intellectual to abandon like the old school style of hardcore critique and revealing, which seeks to dig into systems of power to reveal the system, the logic of the system, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, well, the tendency of a lot of left-wing academics is to sort of turn against that. Now, when you see it that way, that makes sense why some academics are actually have a kind of weird sense of power these days, right? Well, it's this reparative turn. So what I would say is like, well, let's work with that and work from within that. I'm much more interested in burrowing in like, like Marx's mole, like go, going into these situations and kind of coming up and, and, and that's why I went in and um, did events with family abolition people. And then a lot of my social Democrat friends said, oh, well, you must be pro-family abolition. I'm like, no, I'm that's, that doesn't mean I'm pro-family abolition. When I have a debate with somebody, it doesn't mean that I'm with them. This is a whole other thing. Like I, I, I have been prevented from being in debates with people because the culture of the left now is anti-debate. I think that's I think that's catastrophic, man. I really well, yes, yeah. it's it's catastrophic. I I really want to look at your work on Nietzsche and how to read Nietzsche, you know, from a new perspective. Because I mean, you could kind of say that like not only persecution but also like resentment on on the left. And which kind of brings even, you know, like we're saying, like no debate, no dialogue. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, this, this is the thing. It's it's that there's a sense in which if I'm aligned with you, we must be aligned ideologically. It's almost like a kind of we must be aligned ontologically in some sense. We are one in the same. No, I mean, this is obscene. This is obscene. This is this is a um, this is this is uh, well, I mean, it's 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 highly alienating. It, 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 it comes from a position which, if seen from the outside, like let's say you go and tell somebody who's not on the left that, that the left believes this, well, it looks makes the left look terrible. Terrible. I mean, the whole notion of no platforming needs to be rethought, right? Because the presupposition is that the person who's being platformed may persuade someone else. And if they persuade someone else, then you've lost, right? So you're shutting down in advance the possibility of a discursive free exchange. I'm not for it, really. I'm, I mean, okay, on some conditions, I'm for it, but by and large, by and large, I'm, I'm, I'm totally opposed to it. So, uh, anyways, it's something. It's kind of goes back to this notion of, um, I don't know, literacy, being able to sort of read where people are coming from. And also, also that people, they don't, people don't have like highly convinced positions. You can create like a brand and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an ultra left communist. Well, how old are you? Are you in your late twenties or are you in your early forties? I'm in my early forties. I used to be an ultra left communist. I'm not that anymore. Hmm? And people change, Right. And even that, that's actually something going back to Lash, which is like, actually, there's a wisdom in change. So, right, so if you move and you change, you you have a wisdom about what it was like. So you can, you know what I'm saying? So these things are flexible and that's good. It's good that they're flexible, right? It's not, it's not like you're, I don't know, some kind of, you know, not a person of integrity or dignity when right. you shift politically. It's good to shift politically. Right. I think you pointed something out that in the Machine Gun, uh, Unconscious podcast about like sort of respect and like in a sense there is uh, some kind of endearment and respect we should have for the el our elders in a sense and uh, that it, it, if there is a wisdom that comes with that on the left and like those that are of older generations we should probably learn from because they went through different stuff and we're going through different stuff and we kind of have to see where we could reconcile and be able to use that wisdom to propel well, yeah, us this, forward. This goes back to um, this goes back to uh, uh, one of the tendencies. You see, there's a whole fascinating tendency of the 
early left, and by early left, I mean like even like pre-World War I left, who were influenced by William James. And um, William James, in his book on religious experience, had a had an idea in there where he said that adolescence is a time which is clo- gives the subject the closest uh and this is actually confirmed in like different spiritual tradition traditions to um epiphanous spiritual visions right you're kind of adolescence is that kind of initiatory moment on the cusp of having access to i don't know pure experience things like this well, uh, one of the things that capitalism has been quite good at doing is, and Adorno and Horkheimer write about this in the culture industry as well, um, kind of creating a society in which the primary ideal is centered around adolescence, right? And the consequence of that is obvious. It's catastrophic, in my opinion, right? By the way, this is not something that you see as much in the former Soviet societies, there's not the same uh, fetishization of adolescence there. If, from what I've seen of having traveled there and things like that. It's a very American deal, you know? And um, I don't know. I feel like the left needs to, needs to A, recognize that, and B, push against that to some degree. I think it's actually a faulty premise in many ways to sort of fetishize youth like this, it's it leads to uh, very um, unhappy uh, adults, uh, unhappy elders. On one hand, on the other hand, it strips adults of their own profound uh, things that they can teach. So I, I guess, yeah, I want to tell the left to to keep that, uh, to shrug that influence off as much as as much as possible. That's actually yeah. kind of interesting, though, about the fetishization of the youth, because like, if you really think about it, like anecdotally, like, and this ties in with not only just like the politics of the family, but like other stuff too. like, you know, we live like we're so alienated, we're so isolated growing up. And especially if we come from broken, um, broken homes, uh, broken families, which I did. So, you know, um, I, I think this book is definitely not only uh, theoretically, like, dance with a bunch of stuff, like you could also relate to it, you know, if, if, you grew up in that sort of broken down family, but yet you have this sort of ideal that still lingers like the family in itself, the family spirit. And we're so divorced, but then as we get older, we're like, man, I wish I was a kid again. Right. (laughs) And, and when you see in the therapy culture, this whole thing about like fetishizing the child that you were so vulnerable, you were so like, um, you know, validated and you were just persecuted by selfish, uh, gaslighting adults right and uh, i go under analysis uh but not lacanian a a jungian uh uh, analytic work and there is this sort of emphasis on the archetypal child you know (laughs) so even in that sense like these sort of ideologies not only like with the family spirit but also in you know the ideologies of therapy and how Mm -hmm. it emphasizes be a you find your inner child be that youthful soul that you used to be right yeah and there's nothing to take away from those insights. It's rather to find out how the commodification, even talking about Lacan's capitalist discourse of the of the way that uh, the experience of adolescence is meant to be extended, to be rendered eternal, to be made permanent in some ways, for which, of course, that's a kind of impossible demand. Although, if you read a very interesting book of sociology called The Society of Singularities, by Andres Rekowitz, which I highly recommend everybody check out, German sociologist. He shows, I think he's German, um, he shows uh, 1970s till now, although this cult of adolescence is imbued across all ages, even though that's happening, one striking fact is that we have not seen a bona fide youth movement since that time it's a very interesting fact in other words politically young people are actually highly disempowered and that's a fact look at greta thunberg for example Hmm? i mean look at the sunrise movement right these these movements are are gaslit 
by, well, intergenerationally so, right? There's a sense in which, and Deleuze talks about this in his essay on control societies, which I cite in my book at the end of the anti-Oedipus chapter, and I say, ah, he's really onto something here. Because we're now in a situation in which even mass revolts have a tendency for a paternalistic co-optation. So there is, therefore, a kind of new paternalism today. A new paternalism in which uh, even youth revolt uh, is somehow uh, taken away in some sense. So, so again, that's something we should we should be aware of. You know, it's it's it's, it's not a good good prospect, but it's it's definitely happening. But bearing that in mind, then, what would the invention of a new kind of social super ego that might actually be conducive to some substantive change look like to you? Well, I mean, I think here, if you take a psychoanalytic thinker like Wilfred Bion, his argument is that groups should be thought of as producing what he calls new thought. And he said that um, the function of a group in an ideal sense is to, to um, this goes back to the question of the enemy, by the way, uh, uh, first identify the common neurosis that they share, because he says that all neurosis is socialized, but it's missed by the individuals within the group. Because he said as the leader of the group, he recognized that his neurosis was shared with others. This is kind of mutuality. So you have to first recognize that common neurosis. Then you have to make it reflective. And you also have to make reflective to the group the fact that the group uh, produces thought which is beyond the omnipotence of just the individual in that group. And when you've done that, you've created, you've instantiated a new ideal. What I try to show in the book is that if Freud's proposal of superego is correct, the instantiation of a new ego ideal also means with it the instantiation of a new superego. So it's like you can't really shrug that off. You can sort of tame it in some sense. So you could think of the left, therefore, as a project of the creation of new ideals, of the creation of new thoughts. And that's what Bion calls the mystic group. The mystic group is the one that produces new thoughts. Not all groups produce thoughts, by the way. In Freud's conception of the artificial groups, they don't produce new thoughts. And the, the artificial groups are mostly the church and the army. You could say the corporation, the workplace, and so on, the factory, Amazon work, warehouse, etc. They don't produce new thoughts because they're in relations of pure dependency. If you like, yeah, I'm not afraid to say it. They're in a relation of pre oedipality This is stunted Oedipus. There's no overcoming there. So a mystic group has resolved Oedipus in some ways. And they have pointed towards creation of something new. That's what the left needs to be about. The creation of new of something new. Um, getting out of the politics of nostalgia. Getting out of the politics of rivalry. Hmm? Oh, and by the way, the, the enemy piece is, is the common neurosis. So the enemy becomes the common neurosis in beyond sense. And then that is worked through. That doesn't mean that external enemies aren't real, like there still is a ruling class and like Bezos and like, you know, like all of that. I mean, we probably need to be more precise than calling them the 1%, right, uh, in the future. But, you know, like, I would say Wilfred Bion gives us the best sense of this reinvention of the, and this is something that even somebody like Bernard Stiegler says in his critique of Marcuse, which I, which I reference in the book, where he says, yeah, what we need today is a kind of reinvention of a new superego um, because capitalism has deprived us of the soup in his view. And I tried to show this, the social superego is kind of, is kind of a sign of that deprivation because of its acephalic distant uh, structure. So hopefully that gives you a sense of my, my future would, would be that theoretically we should really be very close readers of Wilfred Bion on this issue. I think he right. did this a lot. Yeah. He, uh, most of his group uh, psychology was with military, right? If I'm not mistaken, like uh, the British military. 
That's exactly right. Um, that's exactly right. He was in the First World War. He was a consultant in the Second World War to British battalions, and he uh, assisted them with creating strategies for greater group cohesion um, so that they could face the common trauma of wartime with greater resolve as a unit. And so, you know, if you go back and you tell your military guys about Wilfred Bion and you have them read it, I mean, they're going to be very impressed. Um, you know, and, I, the, you know, you can read Lacan's uh, lecture called British Psychiatry in the War. And he says, like, what Wilfred Bion did in the Second World War is amazing. And we should all give him props. It's it's like next level. Right. Um, and if you read him, it's a lot different than reading Lacan, because there's no references to like, you know, Antigone or like Marx or like great literature or like, you know, like Lacan's always making these obscure references. And that's a great thing about reading Lacan. I mean, one of the reasons why I love reading Lacan is the bibliography, right? I mean, Lacan opens up like all of these books and authors that you never knew about. Mm -hmm. Hmm? I mean, for example, I have a whole chapter in my Nietzsche book on Lucien Goldman and his book on Pascal, for which Lacan gave three full day seminars on this text. And it just like blew my mind. And then I dedicated like a year of my life to studying it just from that one reference from Lacan. You know what I mean? So Lacan is very different than Bion. Bion is like, he's not boring. Okay. But he's very just sharp and to the point and like super straight. Just it's all, it's all there. It's a bit like reading Freud. Right, exactly. Yeah. Or yeah. like any psychoanalytic thinker that's more scientific, you know, Otto Kernberg or like yeah. any of the relationists like Klein, you know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, for readers of psychoanalysis and the politics of the family, what would you suggest um, for a follow up text? What should be read immediately? Mm -hmm. after reading your book oh that's an incredible question nick thank you so much for that question i love that question well you know two books that have really opened up vistas for me is leon rosichner's freud and the limits of bourgeois individualism which is a study of all of freud's social writings from civilization as discontents group psychology analysis of the ego um, a couple of others. I think Moses and monotheism is considered as well. Anyways, but this text gives us um, probably the finest Marxist approach to Freud that I've ever read in my life. I'll just say that I've written a great, I've written a review of this great book, which you can see if you go to my, if my, my website. And the second one would probably be the policing of families by, by Donzilla, which I mentioned earlier. I didn't work with it in the text, but what it provides is a really good periodization about how the family is a political agent from the French Revolution to the present, which I touch upon in my conversation with thinkers like Eli Zaretsky and Lash and Bourdieu, but which Don Zolo really, really makes shine. I would recommend those two um yeah i would recommend those two maybe maybe a few others i would also recommend on the theme of um the working class family it's a great text by jennifer silva called coming up short uh, uh millennial life in an age of insecurity something like that or no, working class life in an age of insecurity and it's a study of 100 millennial age working class young people about their lives and their challenges. And what you find in there is really, really surprising results regarding how our generation sees the family. Uh, because what you find is a clash over ideals. You find a clash over ideals, which is you find that most people can't get married because of resource reasons on the one hand on the other hand they have a inner desire for 
basically, let's call it the Fordist welfare arrangement of the family. But when they try to sort of speak that desire publicly to the public and friends and so on, they get chastised for doing so. And that's a kind of sign, if you like, of a kind of of a kind of class conflict in a way, in a way, right? And a cl a clash over ideals. And so it's 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 in it's important to know that it's important to know that that's the desire of working class people is for that type of family for which they can't most often reproduce. And here I mean like the breadwinner family structure, right? But you know, in reality, it's like she says that it creates psychic turmoil for the working class people to desire that, so they don't. Right. It's so, so it's almost like a repression in a way. So that's a really powerful book. It's a very powerful book by Silva. I have an article coming out on it soon. So I'd say those three. Donzalo, Rosa Chiner, Silva. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Um, what do we think? Should we wrap it up here? Let's say we could probably do that. It's probably good two hours now yeah nice. it's a good any, two hour <laughs> any final comments have we have we solved it all no it was good yeah i definitely i definitely learned a lot um both reading it and then your elaborations like i feel like there's always different elaborations from li listening to the uh mu discussion your lacan in scotland and then the piece that you even gave even at the conference it's like different angles of like reading mm -hmm. and, and re elaborating on on this you know, on this text and then now yeah really oh, exciting you. book i loved it oh thank you guys so much for having me on you know i mean it's it's a, such a vast topic which i hope more research is done on the family yeah. i mean it's kind of strange to look at the family when i say to people yeah i wrote a book on the family they're like you did what <laughs> what what does that mean you wrote a book on the family like you have a fam like what okay what <laughs> yeah it's very it's very strange it's like people either think it's like some cockamamie thing no but actually it's like it's like the heart of social life like this is like it's like mm -hmm. everything this is like right. the unit of socialization it's like uh it's not some like uh you know minor appendage or something like that of, mm -hmm. of social life no it's like i would argue i would argue even like when we talk about ideology we yeah. should be centering the family right yeah. maybe maybe even more than we do like the notion of commodity fetishism and stuff like that, like, you know, right? Yeah. No, it's 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 interesting how uh, eager many people are to talk about the relationships they have with their parents, to talk about their their childhoods. Even nowadays, like trauma bonding is very popular, mm -hmm. but yep, the right. family as an institution, mm. yeah, is something that it. it it never comes under investigation for some reason. It is very interesting. Yeah. And one thing that you mentioned about, um, what, was it the Italian Marxist feminists that wanted to put uh, wages, wages uh, for, housework. for mm -hmm. housework? It's like, imagine doing that. Then it exposes the sort of dichotomy between family in itself as a sort of value and ideology versus the social reproduction for capital, right? Mm -hmm. In that. And that would be so disheartening and it exposed the real of well yeah i mean that's actually economy. that's actually a great point which is like if part of what socialism is about is the creation of new ideals well one of the things we need to train people working class or otherwise is to cultivate a desire for leisure mm -hmm. uh well it's interesting the politics of leisure are interesting because you need to have a desire for leisure in order to, to, to demand it <laughs> and and you know what's funny is that in capitalism one of the signs of profound alienation of capitalism is that people actually don't have a desire, or at least they don't know it, for more leisure. 